Right. So should we move on to so the we, EDS? Yeah. Is it? EDS, how, do you, yeah. how do you pronounce that again? Ehlers Danlos Syndrome. Ehlers Danlos Syndrome. Syndrome. Okay. Yeah. So um, these are for all the zebras out there, and we, you know, speak about the zebras as the the EDS population, and it's because they are not usually the first thing that we think of. So we expect to walk into a room full of horses in terms of like the medical prof uh, profession and the zebra is kind of the weird quirky one that sits, you know, kind of hiding at the back. And it may initially present as something else and it's only when you sort of start to delve a little bit deeper that you can realise there's actually a zebra hiding in the background. And so it's kind of for all the medics out there that it might be listening to this podcast. It's to have your mind open that there might be something else happening and not just like a basic shoulder injury or like, you know, they've just dislocated their shoulder. I have just the head of their shoulder is it that they potentially are hypermobile or even more so have you know an underlying medical condition like eds yeah um so i'll just keep calling it eds from now yeah. on but Ehlers danlos syndrome for anyone who uh, who i'm down with EDS. the eds thing because i will forget the other. Cool, cool, cool. um so basically there are 13 subcategories of eds and it's um, an inherited connective tissue disorder that affects basically how your body um, works. Um, it's characterized by joint hypermobility. So what we did before with all the bait and stuff, that's one of the things that we looked at. It's also characterized by skin hyperextensibility, which is where your skin is super stretchy. So if you can pick your skin up and quite a significant degree away from, yeah, so Renee's got kind of similar to me. Steph, I couldn't see yours for, how, what do you reckon? Yeah, you've got a fair bit there. Yeah. So we've got some skin hyperextensibility and then tissue fragility is the third thing it's characterized by, which is where you get bruised super, super easily. And I'm not talking about mm. like, you know, the first time you hop on a pole and you've got like black and blue thighs, which I definitely had that. And I, I had probably more bruising than the normal person, but I'm not hypermobile. Um, I'm talking about people who still continue to bruise, that their body, like they can be on a pole and it just it bruises a lot um, or it breaks a lot. Like there's lots of scarring and you just, it doesn't take much for the skin to, um, to break down. Um, so the incidence of EDS is kind of estimated in the general population between one in two to 5,000 people. Um, in the whole community, there's no, obviously no research on this, but I kind of estimate it to be quite significantly less. I think it's probably higher. So one in probably every 250 uh, people. Um, and I, maybe it's because I see a lot of hypermobile patients now because of all the work I did on this last year. Mm -hmm. But it made me sort of go, oh, is it even one in 200 or one in 150? Like there's just quite a, a yeah. high prevalence of EDS patients in the, um, the poll community. And I kind of spoke about the subcategories. There's lots of different types of EDS. I won't get into all of them, but the one that we specifically um, we look for all of them, but we, I'm specifically attuned to is hypermobile EDS because that from a musculoskeletal presentation, they will usually come see me first with some other injury that is pretending to be, you know, like I said, a shoulder injury. Whereas the other types of EDS, like vascular EDS, um, usually present to a doctor first because they're experiencing, you know, potentially heart issues and, and other signs and symptoms. So they might see a cardiologist and get picked up there. Um, do you want me to keep going? Can I can keep talking. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> do it. All right. So here's the kicker. Um, so all types of EDS, all 13 of them, can be picked up with a molecular marker except for the hypermobile type. So at the moment, there is no way to diagnose hypermobile EDS via testing procedures. Um, so it's quite often missed. Um, and it makes it really challenging to mm. get uh, diagnosed because there's a lot of healthcare professionals out there who gaslight hypermobile patients, which is, I, I, I don't know whether they're intending to do it or whether it's just something that they, it's just a lack of training. It's not something that's known amongst the medical community as much um, as it should be. So this is, again, why we try to bring awareness to these hypermobility um, conditions. Um, but it's definitely highly missed. And there's a lot of healthcare professionals out there who, even if they do diagnose it, they're like, now nah, she'll be right. And it's, it's quite fascinating to sit back as a physio and watch and go, now nah, she won't. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's really interesting. I've had, I've had a mix of interactions with um, specialists over the last two years. And it's, it's really interesting to see, you know, they'll correspond back to me with letters. And it's fascinating to see some of the different approaches to it. Um, 
but I think the the first thing is usually for EDS patients, I'd say 80% of the time, most of them want a diagnosis. And whether it's an immediate diagnosis mm-hmm. or whether it's in the next five years, they usually want to find out um, a, a proper diagnosis. Um, and the way we diagnose them is actually now a process of exclusion. So unlike the, the markers, which can pick up all the other types, this one kind of has to be a, you have to meet these criteria and you have to not be these criteria and only then can a specialist determine that you have been diagnosed with eds and so this is why physios can't formally diagnose eds patients but i quite often say to people you meet these criteria and i'm pretty confident you don't meet these criteria so you are we'll say uh, likely Mm. Lost and, lost. and if you want to go get a full formal diagnosis then i you know recommend it and these are the avenues to do it um yeah, so it, it's quite an interesting way at the moment. But the good news is that there is research that's come out in the last six months. There's a, a lovely lady up in the United States somewhere, I think, from memory, who has potentially found the molecular marker for it. So in the next wow. five to ten, it's huge. It's going to be life-changing for so many people with EDS out there. It might be a really simple genetic test to wow. hopefully in the next 10 years um, to get tested and actually diagnosed with EDS, which is really, really exciting um, for that particular population because at the moment they're jumping through, you know, acrobatic hoops to, <laughs> to actually find out the cause. But um, Yeah, well, I was just like listening to that. So the three things you'd like, obviously, we've determined I'm hypermobile. <laughs> we've determined my skin's pretty like... Stretchy. Stretchy. What was the next uh, one? Bruises easily or fragility of the skin. Yeah. Yeah, tissue. Fragility. Yeah. So I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> I th- I'm like, I think I need to um, listen more to this. But So if you're sitting here and those things are popping up for you, it sounds like you're on quite a journey mm, at the moment yeah. if you want to continue to look into this. Yeah, and there's some other things you can look into that are a part of sort of the diagnostic criteria. Um, there's like a physical component of the diagnostic criteria. So one of them is the Baden score that we went through earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes people go through blood tests, urine tests and skin biopsies to look at a few different things or imaging. And sometimes they go through the full genetic test as well to exclude that they don't have the other types of EDS. Mm-hmm. And that can be quite helpful. But I think for other people, you know, listening at home, so things that are very typical of EDS or hypermobile EDS patients are um, very soft skin. So unusually soft or velvety is the way that they describe it. So if anyone's ever said to you, you know, you've had it quite a few times in your life that you have super soft skin, then that's something to to look into. Um, Unexplained stretch marks. So if we think about collagen is what gives us our body stiffness, without that collagen, we kind of become a little bit more stretchier in general. So things like our skin become stretchier. And so we're more likely to have stretch marks. And the unexplained bit is the key because Mm. if you are, you know, typical body size, uh, I shouldn't say that, but like we'll say within whatever medicine dictates that to be, and you haven't had a significant um, gain or loss of body fat Mm. or weight and you have stretch marks appearing, then that might be a sign. Mm. Um, We have, uh, this always sounds delightful when I say it, but pyzogenic papules, which is herniated skin on the bottom of your feet. And the only way you can see these little spots appear is when you're standing and the fat kind of pushes through the skin. Yeah, I know it's delightful, the look on Steph's face right now. She's like, I'm like, (laughs) I'm interested. I'm like, (laughs) I'm like, I want to look at my feet now. I know, but you can't look at yourself because you need someone else to look at it. But I mean, like, I know. So these sort of spots that we look for are a a sign of hypermobility. Um, Wound healing is really quite poor in hypermobile patients and quite often they have scars and they can even get like these sort of silvery type scars. Um, Pelvic floor issues, rectal, uterine, prolapse and just incontinence in general is common in hypermobile patients. Um, I always, I find these fascinating. I'm just going to keep going. Tell me to stop if you want. But no, go. Okay. <laughs> um, dental crowding. So high or a very narrow palate. Um, and a lot of people don't know what a high or narrow palate is because they've only really looked at their own palate. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of like a comparison to other people. Um, long fingers and a very long arm stand to height ratio. 
and then heart issues. So these are things that get looked at with um, proper heart imaging. So there's, these are kind of a part of the um, diagnostic criteria that we look at. And then usually they have a positive family member um, with some degree of hypermobility and they meet the, like, the diagnostic criteria for EDS. So that's how we kind of make this diagnosis. It's because it's genetic. There has mm. to be someone that, you know, it's come from. Mm. Um, musculoskeletal pain, chronic widespread pain, or joint instability. So this is kind of your foundation for if you're ticking off some of these things it's worthwhile looking at and there's some really cool fun things that you know eds patients can do that we can't you know collagen typical mm. people can't do like one of them is that they can touch a, lo a lot of them can touch the top of their nose with their tongue and i can't do it <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be the, the weirdest youtube yeah, episode I've... we've had sure. <laughs> Yeah, you got to listen on YouTube, guys. you got to watch it on YouTube. Yeah. It's very yeah. active. Yeah. If you can do it, doesn't mean you are hypermobile. It's just a high proportion of people who are hypermobile can do it. Can do it. And then vice versa, if you're hypermobile but you can't do it, doesn't mean that you're not hypermobile. Yeah. It's just that it's one of those things that's uh, there. The other thing is um, popping your thumb across your hand and wrapping your fingers over it. Because of the long finger situation, a lot of hypermobile people, you can actually see their thumb popping out. Like at the tip? Yeah. So you'll see like the tip popping out through. Yeah, hands definitely there. not. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other one is can you, your thumb overlap your second finger if you wrap it around your wrist? Second. So you just, yeah, wrap the hand around the wrist and, and if the thumb and the finger overlaps. So then that's a sign again of that sort of long finger situation and that's a sign that you might be hypermobile. So there's sort of ways that we assess yeah. for it, which is – fascinating yeah. isn't it i wonder how many people listening have just gone <laughs> holy <laughs> shit. yeah they're sitting there they're like i hope you guys are driving you're not like testing all these <laughs> things <laughs> but, <laughs> hands on the wheels <laughs> ten and two ten and two <laughs> but like there, there's going to be so many people who are sitting there doing these as they're listening to this episode and watch the video or having to go back <laughs> yeah watch the video because you can obviously see everything we're doing but yeah there's a lot in there and like for me personally a lot of those obviously tick i tick some of those boxes so i like i'm sure there's mm. other people out there who are doing the same thing and going oh okay. yeah like what's what's next so if we then talk about that kind of the bigger picture of eds because the musculoskeletal pain side of things is a huge factor and it's one that you know the way you fix it because there's no cure for eds there's no cure for hypermobility other than physio and strengthening I'm and sure. you know it, addressing any issues that pop up along the way and preventative care by making sure you're on top of it. So that's kind of how we, we treat it. There's no silver bullet. Um, but there's a whole bunch of different conditions, and this is where I think it gets just fascinating with EDS. Um, so let me talk you guys through some of these conditions because they're associated. They're not proven to be directly as a result of EDS, but they're, and they're not specific enough for it to be a criteria for diagnosis for EDS, but they can actually be more debilitating than the symptoms of EDS for a lot of these um, these polars and patients. So they can quite often impair daily life and they need to be addressed and considered and treated appropriately. So this is where getting specialists involved is going to be really important and crucial for these people. Um, so these are not limited to just these conditions. There are definitely more out there that I'm sure haven't been picked up or associated yet, but just to give you kind of a... There's enough of them, trust me. <laughs> so anxiety is one of them. Absolutely. Um, so along with anxiety is going to be depression as well. So those sort of mental health conditions are, are, mm. are basically frequently linked with EDS. Cardiovascular issues. So tachycardia, aortic root di di dilatation, cannot speak, dilatation, and then mitral valve prolapse. So these are things that you have to get picked up on uh, particular imaging for the heart. So anyone who's uh, suspected of hypermobility, whether it's EDS hypermobility or just basic um, symptomatic, I shouldn't say basic, that makes it sound yeah. terrible, <laughs> symptomatic hypermobility, if, if you're suspicious of that, then you need to see a doctor to get some imaging done on your heart to make sure that the hypermobility isn't affecting your vital organ because that is where you unfortunately can hear some horror stories of people, you know, young kids, mm. age 17, dropping dead on a football field. Yeah. yeah that's they're, they're the ones who have uh -huh. some collagen deficit disorder underlying and then their heart just stops working the way it should because it's not pumping out quick enough because there's no stiffness in their arteries to move mm. the blood around. Yeah. That's interesting. I do know someone who has... Um, who's hypermobile and she has had some heart issues that 
she wasn't aware and she didn't know, so she's sort of getting them tested. So that good. makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, good. Yeah. That's good that she's onto it. And most of them are like completely manageable. Yeah, and it's again it's preventative care. We'd rather you pick it up now as opposed to your you know we're currently resetting yeah. you on a football field or you know in a ballroom mm. and so forth. It's less likely to happen in pole because you're reaching not the, the same level yeah. of cardiovascular um, difficulty in fatigue, yeah. but it's still very likely. So it's just one of those things. You get onto it if you can. Um, sorry, not to scare everyone with the next <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, all right, cranio, uh, physico cranial instability. So because of um, ligamentous issues, you're more likely to have issues at the top of the neck, which mm. then can lead to a whole bunch of other issues like headaches and jaw yeah. and associated conditions. Um Along that line is something called a Chiari malformation, which is something to do with the brainstem, and it's just a little bit different. We don't know too much about it yet. It's kind of more evidence is coming about what that might um, be for people, but it's kind of one of those things that can cause migraines and headaches as well. Um, Degenerative joint diseases. So they load up their joints more. They're going to get more pain and overuse issues. Chronic fatigue syndrome, it's kind of mm. a very big blanket um, umbrella term again, but for people who experience ongoing fatigue and issues, um, there's kind of falls into this balance, uh, this um, category. Chronic pain syndromes. Um, now, the next one's a big one, dysautonomia, and it's a bit of a fancy word, and it basically is uh, relates to your body's inability to regulate your, um, your physical system. So mm. there's so many things that come under this category, and it could, you know, include things like, um, you know, your fatigue and your, your pains and your, your just heart flutters, just your body's just not regulating itself correctly. Mm. Um, functional... Intest- gastrointestinal disorders is the other one that I mentioned before. So you could be having irritable bowel syndrome, acid reflux, um, abdominal hernias, uh, sleeping issues. So insomnia is another one. Um, this is another big one, mast cell activation syndrome. And it's quite mm. a lot of allergy related issues where people experience um, a lot of uh, what they think is hay fever. And in reality, it's their bodies reacting to the allergens and the pollutants in the atmosphere and they're, in the not the normal way, like it's mm. there's, there's hay fever and then there's this syndrome. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's kind of the next level. Again, I won't go into all the details. Um, migraines. We spoke about neurodiversity, ADHD, and autism. So this is the one that blows my mind a little bit. So there's been some studies on it, but they um, they found that people with um, people who are autistic, uh, sorry, people who have EDS are seven times more likely to be autistic. Mm and six times more likely to have ADHD compared to the general population. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And people who have EDS or, sorry, people who have joint hypermobility have a bigger fear processing center in their in their brain. Um, so that's why it's more linked with anxiety and depression. So there's a huge mental link here um, mm. with, with the hypermobility to these conditions. There's organ issues, there's osteoporosis, teeth issues, which we mentioned before. Um orthostatic pressure issues, so where you suddenly feel faint when you go to get up. So this is called POTS, and this is a very common um, associated condition. Um, Pregnancy complications, you name it, prolapse issues, respiratory issues, scoliosis, skin issues, neuropathy. I won't go into everything else. (laughs) I've spent so much time on that just then. I'm sorry if I freaked anyone else out whilst listening to it. Please don't freak out. It's just me listing a whole bunch of things because if you're like, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, yeah. and I tick off these three criteria of yeah. um, ability, mm. then you might just want to go chat to your doctor. And I, and I guess a lot of these like conditions or associations with EDS and hypermobility uh, can be treated and managed. And yeah. if, if you're not if you're not aware, and but you do have things like say the you know dizzy getting up and that sort of stuff, like these are almost feel like for you, if you do get a diagno- diagnosis, that it's like a little bit of comfort to go, oh, that's why I've been feeling like this or that's yes. why. So, And then it gets you on the right path. So just because you may have that doesn't mean you have all of these conditions um, and you might not experience it in you know certain levels, but that is so interesting to know and it yeah. will be so helpful for so many people. And you might not have the statistic on this, Simone, but what percentage of people with EDS are actually, um, you know, it's impacting their everyday life where they are debilitated or they can't do, they can't function? Normally? All of them. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And it might not pop up till later on in life. This yeah. is probably the, the thing. But mm. it, when it hits, it hits hard. And a lot of them, they can yeah. manage it. Yeah. And But once they put the strategies in place to manage it, that's when they're good. But if they're not getting proper medical care, it will, it will mm. affect every day of their life. And it's uh, – this is why it's such yeah. a hard to diagnose condition because there might be some warning signs in the in the teenage years and early twenties yeah. and a lot of people just push through their hypermobility and they just keep on going, Oh, this pain's fine, it's just a niggle. And it's kind of then when they hit their thirties that they realise there's something maybe a little bit unique about them and they can't quite put their finger on it. And it's kind of like this period of self discovery where there's multiple things that are aligning at the same time. And I'm sure you know, you ladies have yeah. gone through it. It's that you're coming into an adult, and I know that we're obviously adults from the age of 18, but, like, emotionally you're just a lot mm. more aware and there's just kind of a bit mm. of a shift towards your late 20s that happens. And it's kind of like the early 30s. You kind of really start to pick up on things that are then not normal and really focus on taking care of yourself a lot more, uh, whereas I find a lot of the 20-year-olds, they're kind of like, woo, I'm an adult, let's go party hard and let's go do all this mm-hmm. sort of stuff. And then it's the 30s and the 40s that EDS patients are usually getting diagnosed. And our goal is to pick them up way earlier in the piece so then we can do that preventative care because it's not about scaring everyone I hope I really haven't scared anyone <laughs> it's not about that because it doesn't mean that you'll go on to develop all these things you might only ever have one of these symptoms and you might only have some you know mild musculoskeletal pain you might be on the mild side of the EDS spectrum but it doesn't mean that you just sort of ignore it it means that you then get the active management strategies in place so it then doesn't develop into more severe symptoms because they will always be this hitting the wall um, part where and it's quite a common term that athletes use with EDS. And there's so many very well-known athletes that have EDS out there that have hit the wall and it's like their body just hits this breakdown burnout point. And it's kind of like they have to spend a couple of years building themselves back up again. And we can yeah. intervene way before that. If we can mm-hmm. actually flag as healthcare professionals, this population, pick them up earlier, there is so much more we can do. And they can hopefully avoid hitting the wall and going through a couple of years of you know, emotional, psychological, physical trauma because of this. Mm. And, and with all the things, with all the things that are associated with it, like, you know, like you, if you're diagnosed with anxiety and depression, mm. like I could sit there and be like, well, this, 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 and this is happening. And then like you can explain these individual things probably very easily. But when you lay them all out, why it might seem overwhelming and scary, oh, yeah. when you lay it all out, you can start to put – puzzles together but you're right when you start to get to like 30 isn't it funny funny that you feel old so you're like i have to start looking (laughs) after myself now really you're still freaking young ass oh yeah but you're like you start being more aware of what your body can achieve so and what your limitations are and a little bit more body aware but yeah you do start to look at these things and pick these things up uh it's definitely an experience i've gone through in the past couple of years to be like okay how does this all come in together now? yeah it's something i've gone through where i just how i treat my body now is they even as a physio is completely different than what i treated it like five years ago mm. i'm just not maybe not cautious is not the right word but i'm just more selective about what i would you know, subject my body through and I would not maybe rush into a a lot uh, comparatively. Like I might still do the same tasks, but there would just be a lot more steps along the way to make sure I've kind of ticked those boxes to make sure that the outcome's going to be favorable. Let's put it like that. Mm. Yeah. So if you, so what do some of the strategies look like if people are diagnosed with EDS? Yeah. Is it just depending on which part of those categories they take? Yeah, spot on. So every EDS patient is completely different. And so, yeah. like, I mean, I keep on speaking about the spectrum, the spectrum of hypermobility, but then, you know, EDS is its own sort of spectrum in terms of mild food to severe in terms of symptoms. And then the number of symptoms or the number of, you know, associated disorders that they have, it's completely different depending on the person. Um, so it's going to depend on what they're experiencing. So, for example, if they've got POTS, then they would, you know, chat to a specialist about whether they need to increase their salt and caffeine intake to try and build up their blood pressure a little bit more, making it easier to pump, you know, the blood around so they're less likely to feel faint. Do they need to go on certain medication and so forth? Um, so there's sort of addressing that particular issue as one issue that then kind of fits under this whole EDS umbrella. And so the funny thing is so many people go through their life without realising they've got EDS, but they're like have maybe a gazillion different smaller issues and they go and then see a gazillion different specialists for it when in reality it probably could be addressed with only three or four specialists as opposed to 100 different people involved and just 
specialists that have a really good understanding of EDS as opposed to being like, oh, you just have this, you just have this, because there's a lot of crossover and it's fascinating. We had a patient in the last six months where they went and saw a urologist and the neurologist was like, I actually think it's this, and then had to go get a you know a kidney specialist involved. But it was only because they knew that they were EDS was the reason why they thought it could be mm. something really funky going on with the kidneys because it's only like a one in six reason why they would potentially have that particular medical condition is if they were EDS. So it's, it's fascinating. Mm. Whereas they would have never, and they said they would have never thought of that for the patient. Like it would have just not been something that crossed their mind. So it just kind of makes you think a little bit broader once you, mm. you know that there's EDS um, as the primary driver for the issue. Um, you know, a lot of the musculoskeletal pain, it's it's addressing it as that particular issue. And then it's all a lot of preventative care and going, okay, well, your shoulder's been giving you issue at the moment, but you are also hypermobile, this joint, this joint, this joint. And I can see that the way you're doing this on the pole is actually loading up those joints in a less than favorable way. Let's work on that to try and reduce the risk of you know, that occurring versus the more severe end of the spectrum or the more moderate to severe end of the spectrum, they usually have about six different pains on rotation. And it's quite often, it's it's challenging, it's, you know, interesting to treat, it's rewarding to treat, mm. but it's quite often like they'll come to me one day and go, it's the hip today, it's the knee today, it's the shoulder. And I'll then focus on those particular areas, trying to get the pain under control so it's manageable. And then they'll have their long-standing exercises they have to do for that. And the idea is to try and minimize as much active pain as possible, bring it down to base level pain. Like there will be for a lot of these particular people, a lot of base level pain is what like might be a three or a four out of 10 as opposed to an eight or a 10. Mm. And then it's about going, okay, now we build up the stability. You might have pain for a while, but as we build up stability, we hopefully get that pain right under control. And if not to a zero, then really close to it. So really people that might have EDS and hypermobility, um, their pole journeys might look a little bit longer or they might, they'll probably end up being a lot more educated and a lot better pole dancers at the end of the day because they've had to do so much um, to get to a certain point as well. Um, but I think out there for if you do think you are or if you know you are, then not rushing this sort of stuff and realizing that, like you said earlier, Simone, nobody wants to be hypermobile. Like it's not a thing that you want to be um, because it can take you a lot longer. Yeah. And some of the world's best pole dancers are EDS. Yeah. And I can tell you that. I won't point out who, but yeah. I can tell you that from afar is that some of the world's best pole dancers are EDS. It doesn't mean you need to have no. EDS to be the world's best pole dancer. <laughs> some of the, uh, most of Cirque du Soleil, yeah. Uh, if not EDS, they're hypermobile, um, yeah. symptomatic hypermobile, asymptomatic hypermobile. Yeah. So to give you an idea, a lot of them are, um, but it's very manageable with the right yeah. medical staff behind you, the right team and really yeah. good doctor and really good support. Yeah. yeah. I, sorry, were you going to say something, Steph? <laughs> sorry. No, nah, I'm still just taking this all in. <laughs> well, yeah, like I was going to say, if, if that's, yeah, I think I definitely need to listen to this like five more times. <laughs> Again, but Ooh, yeah. that's like what the, one of the biggest things you can take away, I guess, is that it doesn't, it's not stopping you from doing anything. Um, and, you know, we don't want to scare you or anything like that, but it's bringing that awareness um, to it and realizing that actually you knowing this and you sort of working with it and treating it, you can actually go further than what you probably thought you could ever go. Yeah, and your journey won't look like a straight line at all. Like, I mean, no one's journey looks like a straight line ever. No. But, like, your journey will definitely not look like a straight line. There will be squiggles all over the place, but the trajectory will still end up going forward with the right care. Yeah, and we were talking to you off air before that you were going to – you're looking into creating a bit more detail workshop on this sort of stuff in the future. Yes. So um, my beautiful pole physio team, I've got um, five of us on the team and one of my pole physios is also hypermobile and has a very um, big passion for this area like I do. And so we'll be putting together a workshop uh, later on this year for people. So if you are suspicious that you might be hypermobile, we'll go into a lot of detail in this workshop. Or if you are an instructor and you're you know, any instructor out there, I can guarantee you you're instructing hypermobile pole dancers without a doubt. So it's it's going to be a really useful workshop and 
we'll uh, have a live Zoom component for it and then we'll make it record it. We'll record it so you can watch it back for two weeks afterwards. So we'll we'll come out with that as soon as we can. I think that will probably be towards the second half of the year. Um, we're hoping to have a couple others um, at the first half of this year. So definitely keep an eye out for it. Um, if you want to join our mailing list, um, go to my Instagram, so at the poll.physio and um, the link in the bio there, you can join the mailing list and you'll get notified when we put the workshops on. That's probably the best way to keep on the loop on that. And in the workshop, people can ask you, because it's Zoom, people can ask you questions. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. any questions you have about hypermobility, you're more than welcome to bring them to the workshop. Absolutely. So we'd encourage if you can, yeah. can <laughs> the workshop live, please do. Mm. Uh, it will give Danny something to chat about. Um, obviously, we won't be providing really specific tailored no. medical advice no. during those sessions. Yeah. But um, in, in terms of just general like hypermobility, EDS questions, anything like that, absolutely bring them. And that's um, the same with any of our other workshops that we run. Bring your questions because we love them and we'll answer as best as we can. And, uh, yeah, we love yeah. to see people there. Yes. Yeah, so, I love – sorry, I was say, yeah, Steph and I have done a workshop and it was very – it was really great because it's not just like a seminar or a talk where you're just sitting there and listening. You can actually ask questions um, and get information. And I guess with this hypermobile stuff, you guys would be able to point people in the right direction um, if they suspect anything or where to go to find or to see someone um, to and for anything personalised. Yeah, absolutely. We're here to help you guys effectively. Like there's no point in us just listening to ourselves talk for an hour and a half. We're here to, you know, answer your questions and give you the care that you guys need. So, yeah. I just love how we're like all the information that we currently have at our fingertips is just amazing. So thank you to you and your team for like bringing that to us always. Um, but before we wrap this up, is there anything that you want to add on the type of mobility? Um, Anything like, but, I know we could be here probably for another two or three just hours. Just specify with Simone, anything that's in within 30 seconds to a minute. <laughs> yes. As I said, anything you miss that you're like, I just want to get in there. If you suspect you're hypermobile and you would like to be assessed by me, you are more than welcome to book an online appointment via my link in the bio. And I'm very, very happy to assess you and go through the diagnostic criteria and create a treatment management plan from there. Um, that's probably all I need to say. And if you're not hypermobile, you can also do the same thing. If you've got any injuries that you want to get assessed or if you've got any strength concerns or you want to create a tailored gym program, gym program or poll program or anything like that, book an appointment by the, the link in the bio. And I think if you have any more questions, then you can do that and I can answer them personally. Perfect. <laughs> um, everywhere except for the US? Everywhere except for the US. I'm sorry, US patients. Yes. It's not my fault. It's I can't really say it's your fault either. It's the US government's fault. <laughs> can I say that? I yeah. It's something to do with the, um, the, the medical restrictions mm. over there that you can only be treated by a, a practitioner from that state that's been registered. So, yes, anywhere except for the US, I'm happy to treat. <laughs> well, thank you so much for um, this episode, Simone. I think this was like, it was a lot. I think there will be a lot of people listening to this more than once. Um, and I would encourage it because, you know, you hear different things every time yeah. you listen to a podcast. So there's a lot of important information in here for pole dancers and instructors uh, because, yeah, they're definitely in our community. So They're out there. Um, they are out there. And, guys, as Simone mentioned before, um, head to her Instagram page page have a look she's got blogs in there about hypermobility um i'm assuming you've got there's so that you've done many previously. there's so many posts um if you scroll through my gram there's heaps of posts with kitty jane um you know who's very well known and she's sort of made it very public about her her eds journey over the last year or so so I, kitty's one of my patients yeah. that we diagnosed and we went through the whole process but she was very uh, grateful in terms of um grateful so she was very gracious in terms yeah. of giving me um a lot of content so to produce and to make it very yeah. um I guess, publicly known about hypermobility. So go check it out because we've got heaps of videos with Kitty um, demonstrating a whole bunch of the different mm. diagnostic criteria stuff and a lot of information there. So, yeah, definitely go check out Instagram and go check out the, the blog. The blog is huge. Put aside a cup of tea, mm -hmm. you know, get a, get a snack, get pre be prepared. You might have to break it up over a few sessions, but it, it has a lot of information there. Awesome. Um, and we'll share some of that stuff on the page this week because we'll be talking all things hypermobility on our Instagram page. If you're not following us already, obviously head on over and follow us. Um, and also check us out on YouTube because these episodes with the Paul Physio and with Simone are very um, visual. I was going to say, and Theo's so, here. 
Yeah, and Theo is Theo. yes, he's and puppies. <laughs> Puppies and Po, what more can you ask for? So, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you so much to you again, Simone, for being our resident physio and diving into some really deep but great topics.